Um, my name is Maddie Whittle. I am a member of the programming team at Film at Lincoln Center. And it is my great pleasure and honor to uh, welcome you, our audience, and you, our guests, to uh, this uh, edition of Film at Lincoln Center Free Talks, which is a year-round program that we uh, or ordinarily hold in our theatrical spaces. But uh, this year, given our theater's closure this summer, we have moved the entire Free Talks program uh, virtual on, on uh, as you are, if you're watching live, you're uh, tuning in to our YouTube channel to uh, watch in real time, and we're really happy to have you. So uh, thanks for joining us. Hmm. Um, this has been a really exciting initiative this summer, being able to connect our audiences and filmmakers um, around the country and around the world um, over the course of these months of quarantine. Um, and if you're watching live, you can submit questions via the YouTube chat function, and those will be um, passed along to our moderator behind the scenes. Uh, just a few things before we kick off. Uh, I want to thank our presenting partner, HBO, for their year-round support of our Free Talks program, including this one. Uh, also, thanks to our members, patrons, sponsors, and audiences for uh, supporting Film at Lincoln Center year-round, especially during this season of uncertainty and, and uh, sort of um, an unprecedented changes uh, as we've navigated our theater closure. Uh, we've been we've enjoyed engaging with our audiences virtually uh, in this sort of new landscape. Uh, just a few quick announcements on that front. Uh, we are currently rolling out the lineup of this year's New York Film Festival, which will be running from mid-September through mid-October uh, in our virtual cinema and a few drive-in theaters around New York. Uh, member pre-sale for festival tickets begins on September 1st, and the general pre-sale begins on September 11th. So. Uh, those dates are coming up soon, and you'll be seeing more information about the, the lineup announcements over the next few weeks. And uh, just last week, we launched our Film at Lincoln Center Virtual Cinema, which is our own in-house platform where uh, the New York Film Festival lineup will be available to stream. And in the meantime, uh, we have a number of virtual releases on offer on that site, a mix of new releases, revivals, restorations, and um, soon to be joined by the New York Film Festival. So with those announcements uh, being made, I wanna focus on the matter at hand, which is our, our guests, uh, Michael Amareda, director of Tesla, and Richard Linklater, who will be moderating this conversation. Uh, we are really excited to be hosting this conversation. The film uh, was released uh, this past Friday, and if you haven't checked it out, it is playing in some theaters around the country, but also on demand everywhere. Uh, so you can you can find it to watch at home, and it's uh, it's a great film. I won't get into details. I'll let uh, Richard and Michael cover cover that. But um, the film stars Ethan Hawke and Kyle MacLachlan uh, working together for the first time since they both appeared in Michael's uh, 2000 film Hamlet. And uh, it had its world premiere at Sundance Film Festival earlier this year and is now, as I mentioned, um, available in some theaters and online. Uh, so our two uh, guests today really need no introduction, but I'm gonna introduce them anyway. Uh, our moderator is Richard Linklater, who, as you probably know, is a director, screenwriter, producer, and actor living in Austin, Texas. And as I learned, currently quarantining in, in central Texas. <laughs> Um, and he's been a, a, an important figure in the landscape of American independent film for the last three decades. Uh, his 2017 film, Last Flag Flying, was featured as the opening night selection in the 56th New York Film Festival. And uh, he's worked extensively with uh, Tesla star Ethan Hawke. So that's uh, right out of the gate, some, some common ground. Um, and then finally, the man of the hour is Tesla director uh, Michael Almereda, who is a director, screenwriter, producer, and film critic based in New York. Uh, like Richard, he's been making singular and visionary contributions to American independent cinema since the latter half of the 80s. And uh, most recently in 2018, two of his short films were featured together in the 57th New York Film Festival. So both of these guys are recent NYFF alums and we're really very, very happy to have them back with us in this virtual space. Uh, so without any further ado, I will leave it to you gentlemen to take mm. it away. Uh, and uh, thank you again. All right. Thank you. So, well, Michael, I just want to congratulate you. I mean, I've known you for so many years and you're 
your original Tesla script predated even that, you know, before I even knew you. So to just to me personally, I just saw the film just recently and um, thinking of such a long gestation time, it, it, I just found it fascinating to, to finally see it. You know, I've got so many questions of how it might have changed over the years, but my impressions, I mean, it was just, I don't know. I'm just so proud that you, it, it, it's finally here, you know, there, there's a film there from your mind, this self-expression, this, this Tesla poem, <laughs> you know, this waking dream of Tesla that you've conjured up. I just find it really fascinating, but as much as anything, it struck me as the genre piece, you know, as a, as a biopic or what, what that even means. You know, I think the challenge in making a film as a director is, you know, it's what's your content, what's your form, how, how to formally take on your subject matter. And is there anyone more, uh, uh, I don't know, this, this cult myth of Tesla and who he is, he's such a uh, intriguing, closed off, you know, fascinating character. What, what's the right form? And my takeaway is like, well, yeah, I think you did find the visual corollary for someone like Tesla, but more importantly, you, you kind of find the you, you dig at the very definition of representation at all together. I, I just like what you seem to be telling me is like, well, all, all biography is like to represent someone's life. It, it it's an art, there's an artifice. There's, there's, it's, we're all, when we try to tell a story of someone, it's all rear projection, <laughs> you know, it's all kind of, uh, so I don't know. I, I just, I just love, 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 that aspect to it but um so talk about film biographies you know just because you've you've touched on it with other you know i was thinking of experimenter you're dealing with a real person with real events in his life stanley milgram how do how did you approach it and and how has this changed over your decades of this from the your original conception of i'm going to make a movie i'm going to write and make a movie about tesla and then what it is today and has just the, the notion of, I mean, almost everyone agrees biopics is like a lame genre, maybe the most boring, full of itself, crappy genre, very difficult to pull off. So, and, but yet it's so innate to human storytelling. So of course it's innate to the history of movies. It's nothing but biopics. And yet it's a tough genre to crack, but damn it if you haven't got in there and put your own Almereda mind to it. So I, I find this just fascinating. A, a mashup of Almereda and Tesla is a, to me a match made in deep in the, in the mind, you know? Well, thanks for giving me about 20 questions to chew on. <laughs> Pick out any of them. They're, they're all good. And the easy place to start is, is at the beginning where I can just say that the movie I wrote when I was a, basically a kid is not the same script or the same, imaginary beast that I conjured at that time, that mm -hmm. the movie that exists now is tangled and haunted by different versions, different, different conditions. So in some ways I was haunted by myself and collaborating with myself. And there aren't that many scenes that actually survive from the original version, but there was enough within the framework and within the feeling of it that survives and it had something to do with my own adolescent projection my connection to Tesla and Ethan, when we first talked about Tesla, he said, yeah, he's a lot of people who feel alienated and rejected, <laughs> hold on to Tesla, that there's yeah. some sense of grievance and, and yearning that people can connect to. When he first heard about Tesla, it was from some fellow who was making the perfect stone fences. He was, he was young and it was someone who had to tell him about Tesla. There was some urgency a passionate urgency about this wronged and, and re rejected man. And the more I read about him and the more I became familiar with the facts, the more dodgy and, and dim a lot of the myths become. And I became intrigued, as you said, with this, the, the idea that, that drunk history is the ultimate kind of history, that all, it's all drunk, it's all conjecture, yeah. or blurry, blurred by subjectivity or filled with gaps. So admitting that became part of the fun of telling the story because there is a lot of assumptions about Tesla that don't, that, that can't yeah. go away. We can't figure it out. 
And um, what did you, what's your Tesla background? What do you know about him? What can you well, reliably say? I, you think, know? I came out of him probably with a lot of people. I started hearing about him. It was, it was in the eighties and he kind of came to me as a, as a cult figure. I was meeting conspiracy theory. You know, I was just, you know, young and you're starting to think and, you know, meet interesting people and you keep hearing about this guy, Tesla. So he was already a, he was a cult figure then. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'd say he's more of like an occult figure <laughs> now. He's just become that. So I guess I have a counterintuitive take, just what little history I know. I'm not like a, I, I don't know much about his life, really more than I guess everybody else. But my theory is if you're hearing about him, if you know about him, he's not that thwarted. He's not that, you know, I think, you know, you look at pictures of Tesla, he was mesmer mesmerizing looking guy. He was obviously brilliant. People gave him a lot of money to do his stuff. It's almost like us as filmmakers saying, oh, everyone feels thwarted and misunderstood. What human doesn't? Mm -hmm. But if you're hearing about it, like if you ever got a film made, if you ever got your inventions patented and made, you weren't that screwed over. I mean, maybe compared to Edison, but you're doing okay. You know, you maybe didn't have a lot of big bank account, but you know, you hear a lot of people, thousands of people went to in his own lifetime, he was famous. Um, and that he, uh, I don't know. I just, I just think it's the myth of the thwarted genius is per perpetuates, but I think he did pretty good, you know, in the big picture, you know, it, and it's so funny in our lives, we've seen, you, we're all taught as elementary school kids, at least our generation, you know, Edison is this great American. There's, you know, and he's come under, he's almost like the Columbus of inventors. His stock has really dropped over the years. I've seen some pretty tough uh, depictions of him in plays and things. It's like a, there's a revisionist thing going on with him, which I don't, I don't, I'm curious your opinion, your film's pretty fair to him. I think you you like, my impression is you I like, like him. him a lot. I think he's yeah. anomalous. I think they're both extraordinary. Yeah. And they're pitted and one is up, one is down. I don't know. They were contemporaries to, you know, Edison's older, but they were contemporaries of themselves. I don't, I don't know. It's just not so easy, but Tesla himself is this kind of tabula rasa. You can project anything onto him and people, it goes way out there, you know, like, ancient aliens teleportation oh he did everything and everything got stolen from him. i don't know it 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 just couldn't be that simple you know I, I, I think you probably know more than about tesla than all but like three people on the planet so i'm just trusting whatever you well i've read the i read the books and the books are actually very good after the first book that inspired me that fired me up which was written within a year of tesla's death by someone who knew him and which is full of mythology of elaborate quotations of events that he couldn't have witnessed and all sorts of conjectures. And the word genius appears on every, almost every other page and there are no footnotes. After that book, which I actually like and is a kind of foundational book, other true scholars came in and there is a lot more known. And yet in a way the fog only gets thicker and the, the, any attempt to get into his personal life and to truly get into his head is tricky and troublesome. And, and um, and it there is there I, I would like to think there's this is the beginning of more Tesla movies. Yeah. That someone else with a different take and maybe even with more money will be able to take yeah. another whack at it. And other actors or even the same actors, but I've met there 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 as many Teslas as there might be Hamlets. He really is that complicated, mm -hmm. that versatile. To that's he he kind of answers to a level of subjectivity. But what we were working towards became more and more um, solidly about just focusing on about 13 or 14 years of his life before he really went off the deep end because he was hugely successful or at least compellingly, convincingly right about a lot of things before he became more outrageously, um, yeah. outlandishly predicting things that he couldn't back up, that he couldn't right. verify or, or market. But um, what was I going to say? I had this idea when I was really young that he was an Icarus figure. He flew too close to the sun. Mm -hmm. And then it seemed more and more that he, he got out the gasoline himself and set himself on fire, that there was a lot of self-destructive behavior, a lot of ruinous mm -hmm. or delusional behavior. 
And I don't even go into that too much in the movie. We sort of catch up with it at the end. But maybe one thing we can talk about that I think is more interesting than me just talking about my own movie is this trap or, or con confusion about biopics. Because I think that a lot of my favorite movies are biopics. They just aren't playing by the rules. Like Raging right. Bull is a biopic, you know? Right. And Andre Rublev is a biopic where the lead character <laughs> yeah. sort of steps out of the frame for half the movie and then comes back. But there are a lot of great, if, if history provides us with these figures and these stories and these conflicts, there are a lot of ways to approach them without succumbing to cliches. So I actually, I've written a lot more biopics than I've been able to make, but they're all, they're all fascinating to me. Like how many, well, you have a couple of biopics on the side of the road, right? Yeah, it's interesting. The word biopic isn't even maybe the right, I mean, we're all humans. So we make movies about humans, many of which were real people. And so so many movies that have ever existed are kind of technically biopics if you're depicting someone who was ever really alive, supposedly. You're being a little disingenuous because if you make the what? center of your movie a real person who, whose story we know, there are verifiable facts, there's a framework. That's kind and of- If it's a more obscure person, you know, like, you know, someone who was just ever alive, I've done a few of those, like it's a true story no one's really heard much about. Yeah. That's different than doing Lincoln right. or Tesla. <laughs> Or, you know, when you take on Winston Churchill, you know, these are the kind of Gandhi, you know, these are big, it has a- but You've done your, your bank robber brothers. I yeah, I've done some true crime things. That's a, that's and, well, a true crime biopic. Yeah, but in my world, the one that I found, I mean, this isn't about me, but I did a, a film about Orson Welles. This is about a week in the life of Orson Welles, me and Orson Welles. And I found him a similarly Tesla type character. I mean, you can't, like, I guess you can't approach science, electricity and that and not have some relation to Tesla. All filmmakers have some relation to Orson Welles. And similarly, he was kind of a self-sabotaging, you know, I, I just, and had mixed feelings about him. Did, did you did you have that about Tesla over the years? Has your view of him changed? Or on any day, is it different? Like, I can look at Welles and go, clearly this genius, you know, that's unquestioned. And it's like, well, how did you, it's how were you the thwarted genius, the, the one who was denied by the man? Wells is kind of the film equivalent in a way. Well, we have different takes on Wells. I mean, I love your movie, but I, I think I, I do venerate him more than you. I think you, you, were, you were more alert to the feet of clay and the human foibles, but I- we, well, in the we, film, he's nothing but a genius. I just look at the whole career and go- Yeah, but I mean, this is a bigger, issue we could get yeah. Justin Rosenbaum in here as a ref referee maybe but <laughs> how many of the the facts and he, he loves your film I know that but how many the degree to which he was a self-saboteur I think is outweighed by the degree to which he was he was caught in a machine that he couldn't couldn't navigate well, and maybe that's true of Tesla too but Tesla more than Wells more much more than Wells was not in in touch with his inner with his own psychology with his with his yeah. humanness, with his humanity. And that began to weigh on me within the framework of the movie you see and just outside of it, there are things I didn't want to include because my view of him really did dim. And right before we were shooting, I think, or a few months before, Harold Bloom died, um, mm -hmm. who was, you know, one of the great Shakespeare scholars. And I, and I, as a, as a, you know, the reflex is when someone vanishes, you, at least for me, I go to YouTube sometimes just to re remember, just to get yeah. a, Hang out with them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially if I never knew them. Yeah. And Bloom, Bloom gave a very interesting interview with Charlie Rose, where in addition to being kind of unable to restrain himself from drinking lots of water, which not many guests do, he was just sort of clumsy. But he <laughs> he was, I have read him on Hamlet. He read he wrote many books on Hamlet. He loved that character. He was he to, to him it was the beginning of psychology and literature and the definition of humanness. But at one po chilling point, he said, Hamlet doesn't love anyone. He's completely, he compels us. He, we fall in love with him, but Hamlet didn't actually love anyone. And he's talking about the fictional characters if he's real, but that was one of Bloom's points that if anyone's real, it's Hamlet. He has more, he has more entry points and more, more tugs at our heart than almost anyone we can actually call on the phone. But not to get too much involved with Hamlet, but the fact that that there's an element that the biggest Shakespeare Hamlet fan could say that about his favorite character was 
was really astonishing to me, really yeah. caught me up short. And I realized there's something about Tesla where it's hard to ver verify that he had, I mean, he has no known romantic relationships. None. None. And he might, there are rumors, there are, there are, there are, yeah. there are innuendos, but, but he's, the, the key thing is that he smothered a part of himself. And even if he loved his mother, there's no record of letters to her. To her. She was illiterate, but he could have written home and they could have been read to her. It's a strange, he's one of these guys who has a mother love fixation, but there's not really much evidence. He never, he only went back when she died or when, wow. she, when she was about to die, he was in Paris. So there are so many ways to tell the story that would have maybe emphasized that, that really kind of um, icy and repellent side of him. And I think he's, Ethan interpreted more as loneliness, which I appreciated. I didn't want to bury Tesla. I didn't want to vilify him, but, but that aspect of him began to bother me a lot. And I didn't, and that's why there are these other figures in the film eventually that weren't in my first draft who warm things up, who are circling around him and meaning to try to spark him, so to speak, to, to get his and, attention. And even Sarah Bernhardt, I love her position in the film. You because know. she embodies emotional risk. And yeah. Tesla, he was daring as, as a scientist, he could see into the fabric of the universe. He could take every risk imaginable with his intellect, but he wouldn't, wouldn't open, himself, open himself to other people. So that was, that's a dilemma. And that was a challenge for Ethan. I think it was a big challenge. Yeah, because, well, that's the difference between science and technology and art. Art, you have to be open to other people. It's about that's other right. people. It's about expressing the human science, you really can go in your head. And I, I think he clearly was a guy who was just happy in his lab. And, and maybe he, the question is, was he suppressing these emotions or did he just not have them in the social awkwardness? Because, I mean, he obviously would have had his chances and maybe it was just a shield, you know, like I, it interferes with what I do to such a degree. I can't, I'm going to take one for the, for science by not ever being married or being with anyone or giving that part of myself. Cause I'm, I'm 22 hours a day. It wasn't he a notorious non-sleeper. Yeah, you know, I'm like, exactly. a, yeah. I'm like 22 hours a day. I can work for humanity here, but I won't do there. So science, it, it's an interesting place to, to really, yeah, he was, he was hide, always to hide from the world. Yeah. It was, it, that's one way of putting it. He was, he was waving the flag for humanity on one hand, but running from it in another way. And so to dramatize that or to make a story about it, to make a compelling mm -hmm. circuit of, of emotions about it required bringing in, opening the door to other characters. And, and Ethan was all for that because he, he kind of nurtured me a few different script drafts and was always good at, at prodding me to open it up. It's hard to, yeah, knowing Ethan and, you know, we, we both know the, the range of Ethan to see him kind of such an interior because he would like to be a more expressive person, just knowing Ethan, to play such an interior kind of stymied guy personally. You can almost feel the conflict in him, which makes him a perfect Tesla because you can feel the inner. Yeah, yeah. real attention. <laughs> And he, but he had he had this restraint and he had the discipline to do it. But I would, I I don't know about you. I think I've been on your sets a few times. And I think you're 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 more much more easygoing than me and able to communicate better. better. And I often we only had twenty days on this shoot, so yeah. it was, it was um, a breathless shoot. And I would spend lunch alone on the set, and then I'd hear people saying how much how fun Ethan was at lunch and you know how entertaining he was and how. What a great show he put on. And then he'd come out as Tesla being sheer torment and gloom, not sheer, but you know, there's this element of restraint, of closure. And he's not that person, obviously. So that's just further evidence of what a terrific actor he is. Yeah, was. that's kind of torture for him though, too. I'm sure he likes his art and life to kind of be one. <laughs> yeah. That, that's pretty funny. But uh, were you tempted by any of the, I guess you just didn't want to go there, the older Tesla with his crazy pigeon stories and all that. Yeah, we it did have the, feelings for a pigeon, you know. Yeah, it was in the first draft. Yeah, the, oh, okay. the tender feelings between a man and a pigeon was in the first draft. And I had him going to see The Bride of Frankenstein because Tesla was living in the Hotel New Yorker in near Times yeah. Square. And he did go to movies. And Bride of Frankenstein, I think it's 1935, and they were using Tesla coils for yeah. a, a special effects. And I thought that would have been kind of 
cheeky but or cute or fun or something but i also felt it yeah. wasn't essential and that and that if you can have ethan hawk for 20 days why spend a day with an older actor uh, 40 years older pretending to be ethan hawk right it, it, it didn't it lost its allure for me and that's again it's some for someone another movie another film to make but that was a key a part nutshell, of my draft. describe fully to me that that script what year it was from and what what was it trying to be at that point? Was it a studio type film? Was it, was it, a, it was a film I didn't imagine I'd direct because I hadn't directed anything. And right, it was you were so young. Story. Yeah, so it was a fusion. I've said this before, so I hope it's too, not too prefabricated, but if you, could, if you could intercut scenes from Malick's Days of Heaven and Rogue's The Man Who Fell to Earth mm -hmm. and play lightning and thunder and rain sounds over that, that movie, that it would be a spectacle on that level, a science fiction movie set in the past. Wow. It would, be, it would be epic, it would be beautiful, it would be unaffordable. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, it was a script that got me an agent and it then led to, it was an option right. for Jerzy Skolomowski, who's a wonderful, but in yeah. some way we're meandering uh, European vagabond. And he had just made Moonlighting with Jeremy Irons and won oh. best screenplay at Cannes. So it was a weird, it was a weird collision because I was flown to London to work with Yerge and I was young enough for his wife to greet me at the door thinking I was a delivery boy. And I, and I, then was, <laughs> it, it all worked out. All the confusion was healed over, but we, we worked for a few weeks and then the money fell out. But Skolomovsky's intention, it would have been, I don't, I don't know how he could have gotten the money, but there was a producer yeah. you might've been familiar with well, Jeremy Thomas was involved. I actually had one oh, meeting with him. It, it feels like a Jeremy Thomas production. Yeah. yeah. What was the movie you did with him? Didn't uh, you do it? Nation. Yeah. But I talked to Jerry. Jeremy's one of those few producers who you see a Jeremy Thomas production. For those of you who don't know, he's the great British impresario. Did all the Bertolucci films of the last era. You know, that he could really put together international financing and always interesting, mm -hmm. always interesting movies. I was lucky to work with him once and get to know him. It was exciting, but I was, I was just, you know, it was all new to me. And I was, yeah. I was, um, I was also arguing with Skolomowski a lot, which maybe was a bad forecast for my screenwriting career, but I had, <laughs> I had good luck working with great directors, but it was not, I realized I wanted to be a director and not to be. Yeah. The director's pal. And um, one of the arguments was that Skolomowski was interested in, in Tesla because of Jack Nicholson. Nicholson had heard a cab driver talk about Tesla. Right. So Skolomowski wanted a Jack Nicholson movie. And then it was all intended for Nicholson. I was telling him, no, Nicholson should play Edison and Jeremy and, and um, Jeremy Irons should play Tesla. Right. So that was one of our, our fundamental arguments. But the movie never happened. So what if that movie had been made, it'd be really wild to see what sort of hybrid yeah. sort of crash landing that might have eventually had. But it just it's, it didn't happen. I couldn't so. help but feel the parallels. Just knowing you in this film, it hits me on such a personal level, the parallels between you know, an inventor, a scientist putting things out in the world, and an artist, put in our case, filmmakers putting out into the world. Here you have this script from a long time ago that never happened. You got a patent, but it never went into production. You know what I mean? So I feel like every script you do is kind of like getting a patent, you know, or getting, and then every film you get is sort of the invention. Like if you get a film made, you know, but- of that. And then it can be badly marketed and not- Yeah, no, it's a similar yeah. mashup of, uh, it's different than the other arts, you know? Um, science is, is ultimately capital, intensive as is movies you know movies probably the most capital intensive art form we would like to think often you know it's, it's a deal you know to get money and mm -hmm. art industry talk about thwarted having to explain yourself to the capital <laughs> you know, to people with money or you know it's, it's the parallel there to me was was obvious you know it's still, yeah it's still strange to me to this day how much luck can come into it but one thing one other flaw of yeah. Tesla's flaws not to kick him while he's not with us but he he wasn't good at working with others I think if anything yeah. in my filmmaking career I think I've had uneven luck with money but I've had pretty good luck with people I've worked with including especially actors yeah so, and Tesla didn't have a good track record of keeping a team he had one or two loyal people but they weren't equals they weren't disciples. They weren't true 
um, colleagues in many ways. And he was he was not good at working with other people. So that's that's another yeah. demoralizing aspect of it. Yeah, there's a personality thing. And mm -hmm. you know, you got to be big picture. I see Edison as kind of Steve Jobs, you know, big picture, great marketer, great self-mythologizer, you know. It's all for the brand. You know, he was just a genius at that. Not he also was an obvious genius. Yeah. He was like a kid in the sandbox, which is another aspect of filmmaking. We can yeah. that he he was he wasn't just about money. He was good at making right. it, good at losing it. He was good at making it some more, making it again. But he was not he was not a pirate. He was not a pure capitalist. He was right. He was a sheer engine of creativity, and that's easy to get. That, get, that picture gets blurred as all these villainous portrayals of him come up. Why do you think the culture turned on him? And, and why, I, I've just seen it depicted so many times. I was always mixed. It's kind of fun to say, oh, the same way I was saying earlier, Columbus is actually a bad guy. And then, yeah. oh, Edison's actually, but you know, you want to turn everyone kind Edison's of- Edison's a bad guy. There's a, there's a new book, is, if anyone can actually suffer through this talk and get anything from it, I can yeah. see there's a new book that came out after we finished shooting on Edison by a guy named Edmund Morris, I think, who won a Pulitzer oh, yeah. Prize for Famous. writing about Theodore Roosevelt. And the book has a Benjamin Button structure of moving backwards in time, which uh -huh. is kind of weird, but also very readable. And among the things you learn that I hadn't known before for all the Tesla biographies I've, I've read is that Tesla at one point um, had a fire. Edison offered his lab as a replacement and Tesla actually used his lab for a few weeks. Most of the books I read said, that he rejected that offer. There's also a, a case where Edison came to Tesla's lecture after Colorado Springs, long after they'd had their feud about all AC and DC. Yeah. And Tesla interrupted the lecture because Edison was late. He walked down and guided Edison to his seat after shaking his hand. The audience burst into applause. applause. And that's a very amazing story for all, for all the villainy that Edison's supposed to be responsible for. People and like to create rivalries yeah. and opposites, right. ACDC, you know, they want, they want opposites, but when you really look at them, they're closer than everything else in the world. They're actually yeah. pretty close, you know. They were competitive. And I think Tesla was, was you know, undyingly jealous and dismissive of almost everyone. But, and he, for, for good reason, in a way, he was a visionary. He did see, yeah. uh, he was more interested in process in harnessing energy than in making gadgets. But he was, he was also a gadget maker and he was, he was incredible on so many levels, but the, the dynamics, it felt, you know, my, my simple direction as complicated as it got was to tell Ethan that he's a cat and Kyle McLaughlin is a dog. Yeah. They can figure it out from there. And I think, they, <laughs> I think they did. it's fun to see knowing your work, just jumping back to Hamlet. It's fun to see Kyle and Ethan going at it again. You know, they yeah. were they were happy they were happy to tease each other and taunt each other. Yeah, Kyle's wonderful. It's kind of the more fun part, probably to play. Obviously, I would say seeing Ethan kind of and then Kyle kind of, you know, it's the more fun part. It's, it makes it that much harder. But um, you know, we're starting to get some questions that I didn't say earlier. We're going to keep talking, but we'll, okay. we, we've gotten a few questions. What so were I'll some of your other biopics that you still hope to make? I'm I'm intrigued by that. Oh, biopics by any name. Yeah, any there's some. I'm trying to portray. Um, Emerson, Margaret Fuller, Henry David Thoreau, you know, the 19th century. That's you a know. dream project, yeah. Yeah, that's a, the Transcendentalist. I've been working on that for 20 years, so there's something there. But, you know, you do have to talk about representation, and the more you get into history, it's like, well, you can read every diary entry, every letter, every bio, <laughs> biography, every personal writing, and you still kind of it's always, you'll still be taking leaps, you know, you'll still be combining. You're still inventing stuff. things, yeah. Yeah. So how much do you, how do you express it? How do you, where, where is your script at this point? What's the right visual corollary? So I just, I just feel like you, you did that so well. It's Thank as intriguing you. as it, what it must have felt like to be in Tesla's mind <laughs> or, you know, off kilter. And yet, I don't know, but, uh, oh, I'm, I'm just writing. I don't, I don't, it's, <laughs> it's okay. one of those, uh, you know, again, as you're an inventor, you, you have to have these kind of big projections of what something's going to be before you even get the money and do it. So you have to be a little full of shit and a little bit of a showboat, right, to, to pitch things. I'm sure Tesla was apparently pretty good at, or just good enough at it. People believed in him. He was one of the funnest bits of research I did. And again, it was after we shot. So because I'm 
I'm writing a little book. I got offered, and I don't usually get offered invitations to write books, but an old friend who publishes books has asked me to write about Tesla as an extended essay. It's not related to the release of the film. And in, in a way it's a repository for all the ideas and tangents that aren't in the movie. And, and, um, and I'm almost, I've almost lost the thread of what, me, what I first said I was going to, um, oh. what sparked me to do this. Oh, one, one idea is that I began to relate Tesla to Henry James and a lot, you know, I hadn't read that much Henry James, but the James I've read has a similar sense, sense of haunted characters who are not in touch with their own desires or either sm smuggling, sm uh, smothering them or deflecting them, picking the wrong person or running from the wrong person. And it's really poignant. And I, and I think we all might have little episodes like that in our lives. So Henry James became a kind of a way of shaping the story or inflecting the story in an emotional way. And so that's why there's music from Jane Campion's movie, Portrait of a Lady, which almost no one's really commented on, but it was not easy to get that music or to oh, right. <laughs> hide to get it. But it was, it was important to me to make that reference and because that music to me, when I first saw that movie, was hugely important. And once you hear it, it's hard to get out of your head. So the movie's bracketed at the beginning and end by some of that score. And it's meant to, to cast a little bit of a spell, but also uh, as a level of reference to that, that world where certain people could be in the world, but detached from the world, not able to yeah. get their own engagement. I'm glad you mentioned Jane Campion because she's one of the great dreamers of, of, of cinema and, and people's lives. You know, she's done great biopics, the Keats biopic. I love the Keats it. is just exquisite. She's to make one, a biopic about a, a poet is about the hardest thing I'd wish. To I make had. a film about a writer and art, it's just it's just really difficult to do. It's just almost impossible. Yeah. So yeah, she's she's phenomenal. I just I love her so much. But we have a question here. You have both worked with Ethan more than once. He is one of the best, in my opinion. You have experienced his evolution firsthand. How would you describe it? How would you describe Ethan's evolution, Michael? <laughs> it's a little indescribable, but I mean the yeah. the blunt fact is we're all getting older, and that's and the whole world is getting older, and things we love are changing shape, and some yeah. people like Edison is Edison suddenly discredited, and other other figures. It's appropriate that suddenly the Civil War is being reconsidered or even in some ways fought over again. So to, to, to narrow in on the point, not to get too far off the point, Ethan has matured, obviously. He's, yeah. he's, he has four kids and he has directed four movies and they're really special movies. He's written yeah. novels. When, when I first met him, it was years before I actually got to work with him, but I've known him a lot longer than just our collaboration. Right. So I've really admired the, the way he's He's held fast to an almost old-fashioned idea of integrity. And yeah, I almost feel sentimental about it. So that's that, and he's and he's gone out of his way to be. Again, it's an overused word. He's been generous to me. He's gone out of his way to say, "I know you're not going to be able to make a movie unless I say yes." So I'll say I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> yeah. So that's been incredibly valuable, and I can't thank him enough. Absolutely. So, um, but but I've also noticed that. He's done like, I think I counted about 80 movies. And I'll be more interested to ask you about this because part of the gift you've given him or given each other is the level of, of ex exchanging ideas and true collaboration. You don't just hand him a script. It seems like he's been shaping a lot of these projects with you. But I noticed that his, his confidence is just five times more than almost anyone in the room both as a cheerleader as to encourage people mm -hmm. and as someone to say, wait a minute, what are we doing here? And yeah. it's very, very powerful because he's just, he has his experience is so deep. And, um, and maybe it's just the nature of the people I work with in general, that there are very few people with that. It's almost like a racehorse, you know, it's like that level yeah. of sheer power and what he can do and what, how he, how he can interact with the medium. Yeah, no, just a, all in artist. I knew that when I met him, I guess he was 23 when we first worked together mm -hmm. for Sunrise. You know, at that point he had already written a novel, directed a play, had a theater group, had one of the biggest actors of his age range, um, had a hit music video and he was already going, you know, he was fully, the button was on. And I remember thinking at that time, 
because people were giving him shit. He had written a novel. It's like, hey, don't give up your, you know, what a pretentious little, you know. And I was like, Ethan, you're going to come into your own. If you keep this up, you're going to be the most fascinating artist in your 40s, 50s. And finally, he's getting there. And I mean, he always was to me and to you, but some people, you know, you're a good looking young actor. People kind of reflexively don't want to necessarily be very charitable to you, to your, you know, your art. And uh, no, it's been fascinating to watch him uh, proceed through life as an artist and as a figure just deepening and ripening, you know, so no, it, it's. He sees the big picture and that's. Yeah, he's, he's just a fun collaborator too. Good, good team guy. He'll, he'll challenge you in all the right places and support you in all the right places. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you too. He's an excellent director. His movie Blaze is just, just great. You know, I just, I loved it. Thought he was good. And I love the Seymour movie too. So Oh yeah, his documentaries. And I know he's working on one now that's got its hooks in him that will be very interesting. Okay, Michael, here's one you have to you have to jump into. And I actually I'll add to this one. Question. How the everybody wants to rule the world music cue came together. <laughs> Sorry, you got to answer for it, man. Yeah, for that, I mean, presumably people who were watching this have seen the movie, so it's not a spoiler. Yeah. We we had there had been enough cuts within the script that I began to worry that Tesla was too withholding, too recessive, too, too, um, yeah. just that I want, I wanted there to be some opportunity for him to behave the way some people, shy people behave on a karaoke floor where they can unleash some part of themselves, reveal some part of themselves. And, and so I mentioned this to Ethan because he, he was encouraging like the ice cream scene became code for, can we do something else like the ice cream scene? And he, and then he was keen on doing it. And I, I gave a, a list of about five songs, but that was the one I felt was best. And we were reckless about it because we knew we didn't have much money and we knew it wouldn't be nothing. Yeah. There was a requirement in my head that it had to be an unexpected song and it had to be out of time and it had to have lyrics that reflected the movie without illustrating the movie. It had to be upbeat. I didn't want it to be great. Yeah. And it had to be a song that everyone knew. So, <laughs> so that met the criteria. And then we, we were very lucky to have Randall Poster, a music supervisor, yeah. valiantly fight to get in touch with the manager and to wrangle about the cost and make it something that was affordable and not, not, not as impossible as it might have really truly been. So it was a, a, a mixture of recklessness and luck and goodwill. Well, and cheers to them for allowing it. Tears for fears. You know, the group, I'm glad they, you know, some people are priggish about such things. I'm glad they. I would like, I think there's a little bit of a PR plan afoot to have Ethan talk to them if possible, but maybe out of, I, I'd like to think Ethan would walk across the frame if we asked him to right now, but he's in Ireland being a Viking with Willem Dafoe. A Viking king. Yeah, I've talked to him recently. Well, you know, I woke up the other day thinking, you know, you could use Mad World, too. That's another Tears for Fear, you know. It, it captures alienation so well. No one knew me, you know, no one knew me that kind of. It's a little heavier, though. It's a little sadder. Yeah, it's a little more alienating. But everyone wants to rule the world. That's a, is that a direct comment on the Edisons of the world and not the Teslas? It, it, it is. I mean, a friend of mine who... who who saw the movie was, he wasn't so much critical, but the last note suggests that the world we're living in now is a dream that Tesla dreamed first. And, he, and my friend said, well, actually it's a dream that JP Morgan dreamed. And it might be, it's, I think they're competing dreams. I think we, I think it's possible yeah. to live in dual realities and we, we don't know who's, what, how the needle is going to, pendulum is going to swing ultimately. But I think JP Morgan still has his, fingers in every pie it, with the spirit of J.P. Morgan. Again, I mean, Morgan is someone much more complicated than a villain or a, or a pirate, but yeah. he, he's, he, he definitely, as a manipulator, as a, a cruel force for better or, or ill, he, was, he had his mind on matters that Tesla was, um, was not focusing on. So the world's focus seems to be more Morgan-esque these days than Tesla-esque. Yeah. I mean, the the focus because it grabs all the air in the room in the world in this book but you know i think only a small percentage actually want to rule the world and i don't think artists can rule i think tesla's ultimately more of an artist than a 
someone who wants to rule the world, you know, like well, that's sweet of you to say that artists don't. I think they want to rule the world by brand. They, you know, by they brand want to express control. artists want to express the world. Mm -hmm. I think technology and politics, they do want to rule the world, actually. Yeah. You know, I think uh, I mean, and by rule the world, they're always thinking save the world, make it a better place. But the reach is big, you know, technology, even, you know, our namesake, uh, Elon Musk's company, he, he's a guy who those that's a big vision for the world. And, and they see themselves as pioneers making it a better world. But there is a certain rule the world quality to that. Absolutely. Look at the guy who's in office right now running our country. He truly wants to, I don't know if he wants to rule the world. He wants to rule our country or his, his own world and make it his world for his benefit. You know, so it's only in certain fields you're even allowed to think that way. I think most people want to cooperate and make the world better in their own way. And, and you know, I don't know. Well, there are different ways that you can, can spread yeah. its wings and take flight. I think I think Tesla did want to reshape reality. He really, yeah. Whether, whether you call it "Rule the World," again, the song isn't meant to be a direct caption for the movie. Yeah, of course not. But, but it but it is a way of thinking about ambition and about failure and about the inevitability of certain kinds of failure. And the song does seem to encapsulate that to me. And the fact that it came out in the early '80s when I was writing my screenplay, when the internet was journey yeah. was embryonic and when um when all the world was humming synth pop it just seemed like it felt like it closed a circuit circuit and um it's curious about musk because someone obviously will be making a musk movie someday and he's he's a mystery to me he's more like edison than tesla and he didn't even name the company i mean i'm i'm truly intrigued by him but he 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 inherited the company's name oh it's wow. a kind of flute. It's a fluke that his company is called Tesla, but though it doesn't involve an electric motor that has its roots in Tesla's ideas, um, it's, it wasn't Tes it wasn't Musk's own personal link, and now now they're linked forever. But yeah, that's a kind of happenstance. I don't know the full. I don't know who tagged it for originally, but I did read with authority that that Musk just inherited it. Yeah, well, our whole world, you know whether it's in military, someone like Napoleon or great leaders or great inventors, you know, the world does push forward these people who for their lifespan, for that moment in time, they're channeling the force of the future. They've seen the future and they're trying to manifest that in whatever field or whatever way. And we're all, you know, it's inevitable, you know, it's going to push things forward, you know? And I think Edison just in our own field with his little, uh, what is it? Kinescope? Can it's called a different thing. You know, he's kinetoscope, yeah. kinetoscope, kinetograph, you know, it has different names, but you know, he's an innovator, even in our own industry and a, and a manipulator of it, a capitalist within it knew there was a lot of money. Our industry was born of, of industry, unlike most art forms, you know, and that these people who come along and, and really do push it forward. So we'll be forever intrigued you know, by, by these people who did make the world move, you know, who saw what was coming or what was possible and spent their life, you know, like here we are. I, I love the last sentiment of your movie because I think we are what he talked about wireless transmission, you know, through the earth. Some of it was just so far out there, but uh, you know, so much has come to pass, you know, people thought Einstein was pretty, you know, the implications of that we're, we're still dealing with, you know, so. Yeah, Tesla was not a fan of Einstein. He didn't get quantum oh. physics. Yeah. And Edison, to his credit, filled a 35 page notebook trying to parse at Einstein and then gave up after a while. But he didn't dismiss him. <laughs> well, at least he tried. Yeah, he yeah. took it to as far as he could. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's another question um, Do you have any thoughts on other cinematic portrayals of Tesla? Current war, David David Bowie and the Prestige. Yeah, you know. there, aren't, there aren't that many. I'm yeah. part of my book, but there's. I have a soft spot for a kind of awful movie that was made in what is it? It was it was in 1980 um, with Orson Welles as J.P. Morgan. Yeah, right. I've heard of that. I haven't seen it. And and it's you get a sense that he did all his scenes in one day, and two <laughs> of them, two of them are in bed. And he's wearing glasses that are not the right period. And he's, it was in his contract, yeah. Yeah, I don't, and, and Oya Kodar is almost unrecognizable as one of the characters because she's, she's dubbed and she's wearing a lot of makeup, which I think that she, since she was um, well, 
formerly, you know, resident of Yugoslavia, Tesla had to have been important to her. Did you ever have any contact with her in your Wells adventures? Uh, no, indirectly, indirectly. But I would think Wells and Tesla, Wells would feel an affinity for Tesla, yeah. even though he's not would, playing him. I he's a too, but Wellsian it's, character for it's sure. A glib, it's a glib performance. It's not a good movie. Or uh -huh. it's Struther Martin plays Westinghouse, and the guy who plays Tesla is actually has the right ascetic, wounded puppy look to him, and he's. It's a, you can see it on YouTube. So I recommend anyone who wants to just grab it on YouTube. And there were, yeah. there were elements of it that I felt were touching. And, and it, when I first saw it, I, I resented it for existing because I was trying to make my movie. Right. And I thought it was cheap. And now when I look at it, I think, wow, they had some money for some of these things. They had horses <laughs> and carriages and, and construction scenes on, on an exterior street. But um, that movie I feel is intriguing. And it's more conventional, it's more, cradle to the grave biopics territory. And then the prestige of course is, is a pure Pope fantasy of Tesla. It has almost nothing to do with the real Tesla, but it's, it's persuasive mm -hmm. because it's got David Bowie and it's got a lot of uh, filmmaking magical yeah. realism. And, and um, so you can't knock that. And Ethan said he really loved watching Bowie and thinking about him when he couldn't get him out of his head when he was doing his. Yeah. Such an interesting actor, Bowie. Such an interesting humanoid, you know, just a human person. He's, and as I said, when I saw the man who fell to earth, felt the that, earth. That, was, that was my idea of Tesla for many years. That sort of truly no. he landed on his well, feet barely. Like you said earlier, you know, these in such, such an intriguing, complex character. No one film is going to sum up Tesla. Maybe yours will kick off um, another round of Tesla films ready, coming from yeah. different angles, you know. So I think. It's kind of like your Hamlet, your Tesla. It's, uh, it's there for others before and after to put another piece into that sure. forever really intriguing more. puzzle. Mm -hmm. But as, as we try to make sense of the world and the people who've <laughs> made our modern world, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun uh, experience to go to, to live, live in that mind and in those times or, or not, you know, not those times, so. Was there anything that surprised you, especially about the movie? given what you knew of Tesla? Hmm, not really. I was just kind of, no, I just, I just, I just loved it. We're, let me ask one thing, like, okay, so just a filmmaking thing. When you're filming by candlelight, were you doing the Kubrick? Were you really by candlelight? Or were you, you know, a lot of the... Often we were because yeah. Sean Williams, it's worth, yeah, I, I feel remiss for not doing the acceptance speechy thing of thanking all the people. Who made the well, movie. we have limited time. Yeah, Just rest Sean, assured, Sean, everyone did a great job. Yeah, especially I, I, I like I, your relation with him, by the way, Sean. Well, you guys are doing great stuff together. So. He's he's deeply talented and encyclopedic in his knowledge of movies, and he wanted very badly, almost um, with he, he was ready to quit when he learned we couldn't shoot on film. We had both resolved that it was great to tell the story about the invention of of alternating current, not the invention, but the harnessing of alternating current right. and the genesis of film production, why not shoot on film? But the Bond company wouldn't bond the movie. I took it personally, but then Todd Haynes and Ed Lockman were shut down with a much bigger budget. So it's hard to shoot on film these days, as you know. Yeah. And we, we, were, we were fighting for it and Sean was disgruntled, but then he realized he couldn't have gotten the low levels of light that we required. And it was, it was, it was a little bit of a saving grace. So we, we also learned that in New York, if you light a match, even you need like three different people if you're shooting a union film, and the bud that was a big budget overload to to, sh to light lanterns and matches <laughs> every shot. Wow, was Good old New York uh, union. Yeah. yeah, it was cruel and it was unexpected, but I don't regret it. But it was a big part of how we thought about the, how the movie would look. Sure. Yeah, well, you still you, you managed. It, it's very cinematic, and I, I don't know. It, like I think it fit. It artificial fits. backgrounds, but real light. Yeah, you know, I, I love the embracing of all that. And uh, one last thing, when I, I've, I've been around Ethan long enough that he's been working with Tom Stoppard. I've heard his Tom Stoppard impressions forever. And I was his, his accent, I go, I think it's about 45% Tom Stoppard in there somewhere. Did you talk to him about that? Did you ask him? He was Ethan, very candid about that. What's this, uh, where's your accent coming from? Yeah. Well, you know, when he was first bringing it out of the showroom, 
it was about 95 percent stomp tom stop oh, okay you you and dialed it, was, it back yeah i mean i think he dialed it back i think he recognized or maybe he was just he there was some sort of sanity prevailed but tom <laughs> Stoppard is I've, I've been lucky to be in tom stoppard's presence thanks to ethan and yeah. he's got a great accent but it's not quite it wasn't quite appropriate it was also yeah. you know potentially distracting um and so he Ethan's accent, non-accent, is is intriguing. How he he made it work. I really have to hand it to him, because he was he was skating on thin ice. Because we all know Ethan Hawke is not Serbian, but we all <laughs> no. the, the whole movie is about suspending disbelief or not suspending it, as the case may be, and yeah. going with with what the movie pr projects and delivers. taking it on. And I know Ethan's mind that mindset of your lead actor is very important. And for Ethan, it was just I want to occupy the space of the smartest person I've ever met. So, the, the, was, so you a, get a little bit of Tom, you get a little bit of Tom in your, in your Tesla, so. I noticed um, the lighting's fading. That's almost appropriate for, um, I haven't done any Zoom talks, but this, uh, the sun is fading and the light. light totally match. Me. You're one hour, you're getting darker, which is perfect for Tesla. I think yeah, you need to correct. pick up the lantern or, it's but awesome. anyway, okay, Michael, well, again, congratulations so much on the film. Good luck. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm heartened that it's actually in theaters in this streaming only environment. It's actually, you can buy a ticket and go to a theater today if you wanted to. 130 theaters if you're in Utah, Texas, Ohio, Florida, Kansas. It's a strange world as we know. That's a lot of theaters for an indie release these days. One more than my Isn't movies it? usually get in insane in insane circumstances, but yeah. But I, I miss you, I miss Texas. I hope to yeah. see you in the world well, dry side up. I'm long. glad we got to talk about your movie and I'm just glad I've uh, finally got to see your movie that's been, you know, simmering in your head for ever since I've known you and long before. So. It's, still, it's still simmering. That's the weird haunting. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. You don't totally yeah. satiate these things. I'll send you a copy of the book. Yeah. Maybe. Thanks again. Wonderful. Okay, Michael. Thanks so much. Congratulations. And Thank yeah. you. Great hanging out Great. with you. Okay. Bye.